Hello everybody, this is Stuart Wilde. Welcome to a two-tape series on affirmations. In this series, we'll talk about energy and your life. We'll talk about what empowers thought forms and what takes them from fantasy into reality. And we'll look at creating affirmations of feeling or affirmations of essence or action so that your life becomes an affirmation of what it is you believe. It becomes an affirmation of self-empowerment. So that gradually, step by step, over a period of time, you can replace the programming in the mind, the negative, debilitating uh, programming that holds you back, and replace it with thoughts and feelings that create your freedom, that create your empowerment in life. If I ask you the question, are you free, you will answer, yes, yes, of course I'm free. And I certainly did when that question was posed to me once. But when we look at what we mean in the sense of freedom, we understand that there are levels of freedom. To a person that has been in prison for, say, ten years, if you let him out for a two-hour lunch, he would say, this is freedom. And yet we would look at him and we would say, well, that isn't freedom because you're just out for two hours and this afternoon you're going to have to go back to prison. When you look at your life, you're going to look at it and see whether or not you genuinely experience freedom. This means freedom in the sense that um, your physical body is free and that you enjoy a modicum of good health and agility and mobility. Is your mind free? Or are you encumbered by a thousand beliefs and thoughts that create prisons around you? Is your life free? Is the environment that you have created around you an environment that supports you? Does it endorse you? Does it support you? The place you live, you know, the people around you, the interpersonal relationships, your family, your loved ones, your spouses, your children, the people you work with, is that arrangement, is that relationship designed to empower you or does it debilitate you, pull you back, drag you into emotion and basically make you less than what you are? For all of my philosophies and all of my tapes and the teachings that I'm putting together at this time are all designed to allow the individual to become an individual. Now, when you say to somebody, well, are you an individual? They say, yes, of course I am. You know, I, I'm, I live here. I have this name. I'm this sexuality. I'm this national person or whatever. I belong to this nation. And they believe they have individuality. But I want you to look today at exactly how much individuality you express. Or do you express an individuality that is basically a rehash of other people's ideas, other people's religions, other people's philosophies, other people's uh, sayings and thoughts, other people's feelings, other people's uh, ideas. And then as we look at exactly what makes up our life, we begin to look at each and every aspect. And also we're going to look at the finances in your life, the creativity. Are you free in those areas or are you controlled by other people? And as we look at that, you're not going to, let's say, bash yourself up. for This is not a witch hunt, or it's not a way of saying, let us look at the negativity in your life. It is saying, let us step back from our life, or from your life for a moment. Let us step back, and let us, in a non-judgmental, non-critical way, look at exactly what it is you live what exactly it is in an energy pattern. As you look at your life, you understand that your life is energy. Your body feels physical, and you experience it in the physical dimension, say, but of course it is not. It is basically consciousness. Of course, your thoughts are consciousness, your physical body is consciousness, and the physical plane that we live in is also consciousness. Now, you could look at a mountain and you could say, well, that is a solid mountain. And you're correct. It is solid because the atoms and molecules are moving. 
approximately at the speed of light, and that is what makes the mountain solid. However, within the atoms, there is very little solidity, and basically most of the mountain is not solid or not there. And the physical plane, the planet we stand on, the solar system and the universe we live in, is basically thought form or consciousness, but a different kind of consciousness than the consciousness that we experience when we engage our mind in thought. But it is consciousness. And so what you are is a conglomeration of thought forms, feelings, attitudes, and physicalness that go to make up your life. And the life that you lead, the life that you experience, is a reflection of you, the inner you, and of course also the outer you. For within the physical plane, we have the ability to change our circumstances through action and reaction, and we have the ability to change our circumstances through thought, through attitude and through feeling. Each one of us believes what it is that we believe. And so if you go to a Muslim and you ask him to describe to you his beliefs, he will talk to you about Allah and the Quran, and he will talk to you about his philosophy, his life, the village he lives in, the traditions and the understandings, and what happens at what festival and when. And he has a belief pattern. If you go to a Jew and you ask him about his belief pattern, he will tell you about Zionism, he will tell you about the Torah, he will tell you about his life. If you talk to a Catholic, a Catholic will talk to you about the life of Jesus and so on. And each one of us lives with these belief patterns that we take on. I believe, as I've said before in my other tapes, that you, you are not basically a physical body, but that you are a divine energy inside a body that I call the higher self. And I believe that the higher self has an ability of perceiving before it comes into the physical plane what it is going to be getting into. And so if it is going to be Muslim or Jewish or Catholic or Shinto or British or French or Mongolian or whatever, it knows that. And I believe that it has a perception of what the destiny pattern is going to be. As you came into this physical plane, you agreed to take on the mindset of the race, of the nation, of the people, of the karma of the time. You took on the metaphysical understanding or the lack of. You took on, let's say, a strict religious background, or let's say you were born into a family where there was very little religious attitude. But... Basically speaking, whatever it is that you took on is your challenge, your heritage to go beyond. And I believe that we are here in the physical plane to experience restriction. For when we experience restriction and we understand it, by going through it, we become free. In the sense that you cannot have, let's say, for example, saints and great holy people if you did not have evil. For you have to have evil in order to compare it to something and say, well, this person is a saint in relation to evil. You have to have restriction in relationship to freedom. And so I believe we come into the physical plane, disease, war, famine, restriction, difficulty, manipulation, all of that stuff, poverty, whatever it might be, that we come to experience it and go beyond it. As you are working with your spirituality, as you are working with your understanding, as you want to create around you an atmosphere that is stronger, that is more positive, what you are saying is, hey, I've gone beyond the mindset that I took on and now I want to be something different. I want to create absolute freedom. And absolute freedom, in my view, is the ability to move at any time place at any time. It is the ability to walk out of the door tomorrow morning and never come back. It is the ability to have enough money around you to do those things that you want to do. So if this day you decide to walk out of the office and go to Peru for six months, you can do it. And if you can't, you're not free. It is the ability in the physical sense of having a body that is under control. It does not necessarily have to have absolutely no ailments within it, but at least it's under control. 
And when something comes out of balance or out of control within the body, that you don't literally fall off the shelf with fear, but that you begin to take self-healing steps to control that. And if you don't know how to control that, or you don't understand, or you are imprisoned by the difficulties that are there, then you are not totally free. And I would ask you to look at becoming free or freer. Okay? In the sense of interpersonal relationships, we have to live on the earth plane with other people. Some of those people are very close to us, our loved ones, our families, and so on. And as we begin to live with other people, we understand that we, each one of us, is individual. You are an individual. You are not somebody's wife or somebody's husband or somebody's mother or father or the son of another being. You are an individual, infinite, higher self inside a body. And even though we may feel responsibility and love for those around us and we may care for them and love them and want them to be successful, there's a point where we have to allow each and every person to be what it is that they want to be, to become whatever it is that they're going to become, even if we don't agree with it, even if what they want to go be to us is revolting and imbalanced and difficult. And so freedom in interpersonal relationships is saying, I am an infinite energy inside a body and I am individual. I honor and respect my life and I honor and respect my needs first. Whatever your needs are, whatever this other person's needs are, I respect their needs and I will not infringe upon them. I will allow them the same sacrosanct individuality that I'm establishing within myself. And I understand that I am not responsible understanding that when you look at difficulty out there, when you look at imbalance, you have to understand that the people that are going through the pain and the difficulty and the struggle are doing it for a reason. For a reason. That there is power in pain. That there is power in poverty, in restriction, in drug addiction, in, in alcoholism, in whatever it might be that people must be allowed to experience the gamut of restriction. And actually what they're experiencing is the unfolding of their personal freedom. Okay, you might say, but that is an extremely painful way of learning. And I would say to you, yes, you're right. But we cannot, as individuals, go fix it for them, because that is an infringement. And haven't you had the experience, I certainly have, where I've seen something going on and I've rushed in to, to fix it, to heal it, to save it, to change it. And I found that I've infringed upon the people. They became angry. And the minute I left, they carried on doing exactly what they were doing before I got there. And you will find that. So as you understand what freedom is in interpersonal relationships, it is firstly granting the freedom to yourself saying, I am an individual, and I will do whatever it is I want to do. I'm not going to infringe upon other people. I'm not going to cause them, uh, you know, difficulty or in any way restrict them. But I am going to announce to the world that what I want is important to me. You see, we tend to think that the God force asks us to sacrifice, and it doesn't. God does not ask us to give up our life or sacrifice ourselves for others or, 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 or debilitate ourselves in such a way, that is not a part of the universal law. It is a part of some of the teachings that have been written down in the books and so on, but those teachings, many of them, come from the manipulations and the attitudes of man. And man says, yeah, you've got to go out and sacrifice yourself for the world, but the God force doesn't ask you to do that. The God force does not ask you to trudge off to your execution. You know, it doesn't ask you to, to drop dead uh, trying to save a village, save a nation, save a religion, save a community, save a cause. It doesn't ask you to do that. It doesn't ask you any of those things. It asks you basically to become more 
of the light or the life force within. Because as you expand in your consciousness, you become an affirmation of the infinity within you. You step out of ego, subconscious mind, belief patterns, mindset, physical plane, and you drift gradually over a period of years into the inner you. And that inner you is eternal and infinite and magnanimous beyond belief. Magnanimous. And magnanimous to a person that understands spirituality is the ability in the, in the individual for them to say, I am what I am. And what I am has beauty and strength. And I know as this individual within me that I cannot change the world. I cannot go out there and fix it for them. All I can become is strong. Then people will come to me, and if they ask me, I will say, yes, this is how I did it. I did it in the following ways, and I will explain how the process took place. But basically speaking, that is the goal that you are trying to achieve. Once you become this power mode individual, you become an affirmation of power, then you can step back and you can go back into your community. You can go back into your church. You can go back to your people. You can return to the geographic area and you can be there for them. Without that strength, you and them all splish splashing in the lifeboat together and it doesn't work. And you can never, ever, ever change the world by going to the world and saying, please change. I'd like you to change. I'd like you to take on these belief patterns. I'd like you to take on this energy. They won't. In fact, they will resent you. They will feel infringed because you have to remember that people believe what it is they believe and they think it's real. They believe it to be real. And you cannot go to a, 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 a conglomeration of consciousness and say to it, the things that you believe are not real because they'll kill you. They will kill you, they will chase you out the door, and you will literally find the imbalance around you heightened tenfold. And so, before we begin to look at how to create affirmations of power, I want you, I would request that you look at your life in relation to energy. Understanding that all of the imbalances, difficulties and restrictions that you have gone through have been a part of your unfoldment. And you can forgive yourself for your failings. It's almost as if you would look at your limitations and you would fall in love with them. And you would say, hey, these limitations that I've had, these imbalances, these difficulties that have been with me over these years, I'm falling in love with them. I love them. Look how neat I was. Look how wonderful this was. I created this absolutely humdinger of a disaster. But wasn't it neat? Because within that disaster, I learned about myself. And the people that were in the scenario of the disaster with me say, they learned about themselves. And so when you look at your life and you cast your mind back, you will see that the places where you have acted less than best, say, less than strong, less than free, less than magnanimous, less than individual, were a way of you understanding individuality. And so the first point that I'm asking you to look at is to clear out the old. If you look at the history of many people's spiritual evolution, you will find that in many people's life, there is a turning point. There is a place where suddenly everything changed. And often, at that turning point, you will see a great disaster. You will see a bereavement, an accident, a bankruptcy, a, a disease, a near-death experience, some kind of immense trauma. And when that trauma took place in the person's life, it was almost as if the trauma created within the individual a click. A click that opened a door. The reason this is so and the reason why disaster can be so neat and so useful is 
that it is in a disaster that the ego or the basically personality foundation that you have within the psyche, okay, is rattled. Normally speaking, you will go to an individual and you will say, hello, and they will say, hi, I am John Smith, and I'm this and this and this, I live in this area, I do these things, and they will describe to you the pattern of the feelings and thought forms that are around them and within them. And it is impossible to shake those thought forms. However, if suddenly John Smith crashes into a truck at the stoplight and winds up spending four months in hospital and nearly dies and every bone in his body is broken, the ego takes such a bashing, the sort of, the, the pomposity of the self-image takes such a bashing that it literally retreats. And when it retreats, the higher self can come around and bring forward to that individual a new perspective. It is almost as if you would come into the physical plane, you would have one incarnation, okay, and then at some point suddenly there's this crescendo of energy, bang, and suddenly you would come out of it the other end, a new person, a new incarnation. And that happens to people all of the time. And you can talk to it, and I'm sure perhaps it might have happened in your life. It certainly did in mine. And I had one of those crescendo disasters. And suddenly my whole self-image fell totally to the floor. And in picking it up and reconstituting it, I began to look at myself. And I began to take on, uh, you know, new ideas. I read books. I went to courses on mind control, on meditation. I studied as a medium. I trained. I went to the pyramids. I, I began to look and study and say, hey, what is this around me? What is consciousness? What is belief pattern? What is energy? You see, your life as energy is basically you experiencing yourself. Thought forms are created from within the mind, and depending on their strength, and we'll discuss this in the next tapes in this series, um, but depending on the thought's strengths, it creates around you a mantle or overcoat, and you walk through life with this layer of thought form around you. And then as a physical being, you interact into the dimension of the physical, and you pull to you thought forms and feelings that are congruent to your own, the same as your own. And so if you are interested in motorbikes and marijuana, you will ride a motorbike, smoke marijuana, and gradually you'll find other people that ride motorbikes and smoke marijuana. If you are a Methodist and you enjoy making quilts, you will find other Methodists and you will join the Methodist Quilt Makers Club. And that is life. And so as you look around you, you can see the strength and the power that you have within you by looking at what is around you. If you are surrounded by powerful, creative, freedom-seeking individuals, that is inside of you. If you are surrounded by restriction, limitation, manipulation, then that is around you as well. Now, this is not intended to horrify you or shock you or in any way make you feel uncomfortable, but it's saying that no matter where each one of us is, at any one given moment in our life, in our spiritual quest through infinity, there is always a point out ahead that is freer, that is brighter, that is more endorsing of self, that is a greater amount of the inner light. Each one of us believes that the dimension around us has beauty. And you could go to a person that lives in absolute squalor, in the most restricted, difficult, and unpleasing situation, and you could talk to him, and he would describe the beauty of the dimension he lives in. And the dimension that you live in, the physical environment, the thought forms, the feelings, the affirmations of essence around you, that is, those things around you, you will say, this has beauty. However, to a superior being or to some great master should happen through, say, for example, he would look at that and he would not see it as beautiful as you. So the first point that we're going to look at as we clear the deck, so to speak, is to understand that in order for new or change to come about, you have to subjugate the ego. 
Now, obviously, hitting a truck at the stop sign's one way, but the other way is to begin to look within yourself. And looking within is constantly reviewing your feelings, your thoughts, your attitudes, reviewing the results of your actions, and understanding what parts of your life are ego-based, are self-serving, and what parts of it are not. What parts are spiritual and magnanimous, and what parts of it are restrictive and manipulative. And if you can do that, you don't have to go have an accident or a serious disease to create the change. You may want to go to a to a, a seminar, or you may you may want to read a book, or listen to a tape, or something that would change your attitude or change your life. But you can create that within you. As you look at the dimension around you, it is important not to become too smug or too self-satisfied about what it is you are, because when a person believes that they are this this sort of incredible being, that stops them from moving forward. And so, what we understand when we look at self-image in the metaphysical, spiritual sense of the word is, we look at saying, "I am what I am," meaning. That I have integrity, I have this infinity within me, but I also understand that there's an awful lot of energy out ahead of me that I'm not a part of yet. But developing, centering upon this power inside of me, and having the courage and the bravery to go beyond the limitation, beyond the mindset that I have, that I can achieve a new height within me. When you can sit down and understand that everything that you believe is basically not real, and only becomes real because you believe it, then you can say, "Hey, these beliefs, these thought forms were neat. Now let me go through the library. Let me go through these layers that are around me, and let me see which parts I could give away, which parts I could get rid of, which parts I could unclip, and can I step from this day?" Believing less than I did yesterday, because the life force, this light within all things, the God force, does not ask you to believe this or that or something else. Okay, only man does that. So one group, a religious group, will say, "Well, you got to believe this to be righteous," and another religious group will say, "No, no, no, you got to believe that to be righteous." And there's fifty-five thousand Christian churches, and then let's add in all the others. You know, each one of us believes what we believe to be the righteous path, but of course, the God force doesn't give a damn what you believe. It isn't involved in that kind of judgment. It does not judge you. It does not look at your mistakes and say ne 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 ne. It doesn't do that. It allows you to look at your own mistakes by experiencing them. And so, before we move on. To affirmations of power and affirmations of thought and word and feeling, let us take a moment to take stock of what we are. Let us look back through our life, see the strengths, see the successes, honor the disasters for what they taught you, and understand that whatever you have experienced to this day in this life of yours so far has been beautiful, and you created it, you pulled it to you. And you created it, and you are totally responsible. As you can say, I am responsible for this life of mine. That already becomes an affirmation of consciousness, an affirmation of power within that very, very thought form. For millions upon millions of people out there do not believe that they don't accept it, and they will blame anybody other than themselves. So let us look at that. And if you would like to take a moment in the next meditation that you have, or the next time that you are with yourself, or the next time that you're in prayer, I would take a moment to review and see that your life has been basically a triumph of understanding, even if you don't understand it. It's still a triumph of understanding, because within the higher self, within the real you, there is no negativity. There's no pain. There's no loneliness. There's no frustration. There's no fear. There's no disease. There's no restriction. It is all understanding. It is all becoming a greater manifestation of the light, 
or the love that is within the universal law. Thank you. On this side, we will look at affirmations of power. And we will look at developing within you what I call power mode, an essence of energy coming forward consistently so that your life is not a series of ups and downs and highs and lows, that it is consistent, that you maintain a level of energy and you keep that level of energy going day by day, no matter what kind of things come into your life, what kind of difficulties, what kind of challenges, motion, travel, you know, comings and goings and so on, that basically speaking, the power mode is always there. As we look at power, we have to understand that it is okay to be powerful. And in our society, especially in the Western society, People have a way of shunning away from power. This was especially so in the 1960s and early 70s when people sort of developed almost like a paranoia consciousness where the CIA was hiding behind every bush and obviously the government must be, you know, infringing upon the people here and infringing upon the people there. When you say to people power, they, 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 they cringe, they worry. They feel that power must mean manipulation, infringement. However, in the metaphysical sense, you have to decide to become powerful. If you do not decide to become powerful, you will not be able to control the reality around you. And reality will, in effect, control you. Power from within self is not an infringement upon other people unless you project that power to manipulate those people in some way, to infringe upon them in some way, or to act upon them in some way that does not honor them. However, you have to decide that within you it will be okay for you to become powerful. As you understand that being powerful does not necessarily mean infringing upon others, then suddenly you can grant yourself permission to become what it is you want. Becoming what it is you want is basically you saying, hey, I am going to manipulate my reality for my own benefit. And that does not mean that I am not a holy person, that I do not believe in God, it does not mean that I do not love myself or love the world or care for it or care for nature or the ecology or the dimension around me. It just means I understand that my gift, the greatest thing that I can do, is to become powerful within myself, silently powerful, not wielding that power, not wearing the power on my sleeve, not pushing around with it, not saying to people, come hither, I'm this great power, I'll show you the way, I'll heal you, I'll fix it for you, but just developing power within oneself so that the thought forms, affirmations and feelings we create have power. You see, your thought form only exists in the strength that you are because you are the creator of that thought form. It is like looking at an atomic power station and saying, what is the quantity of the electricity being generated here? Well, the strength or the quantity of the electricity being generated is only as strong as the power station. And you are a power station. As we look, as we will look at the, the strength of thought forms, I will give you five ways of working with thought power. However, before we can look at consciousness and power, I've got to ask you to look at yourself as a power being. Once you feel powerful, you can begin to identify who you are, and you can begin to identify what it is you want. And it is perfectly okay to want things. 
it is perfectly okay to say, I want this, this, and this, and this, and that, that, and that. You have permission, basically, to succeed because the life force or the God force is not involved in your day-to-day -day success or failure. It could care less how well off you become or how healthy you are or how happy you are. It is just a power within you that acts in an impartial way, empowering your life, but it is not intimately involved in worrying about whether or not you're going to get a new car. It is not intimately involved in whether or not your life is working and there is strength in your environment or if there is not. And so as you begin to understand that to be powerful, you have to feel powerful, then you begin to identify what it is you want, and you understand that you are going to achieve your goals through an interaction of consciousness, feeling, attitude, and action. Being in the physical plane, there is a point where there has to be action. And I've certainly wish witnessed many people on the spiritual path who take on the idea that their reality is created by consciousness and feel, and they feel that, basically speaking, all they have to do is hold the thought and somehow, some way, everything will be provided for. And I've watched people go from relevant affluence, relative control of their lives, to abject poverty using those concepts. You know, you can hold the thought, you can hold the power, all is well. The life force, the God force, Lord will provide. But there also has to be action because we are physical. And so at some point there has to be physical action. As you begin to look at what it is you want, I ask you first to consider those parts of your life that you no longer want. In other words, the more that you clear away, the more you open for other things to come into your life. And so, in looking at what you want, take a moment to consider those aspects that you don't want. The clutter, the things that you have around you, the associations, the belief patterns, the attitudes, maybe the geographic area that you live in is something that you no longer want. Let us look at that, and let us look at those parts that you feel do not empower you. Then, having made up your mind to get rid of those things, and, have t and having taken the physical action of actually doing it, rather than procrastinating and saying, well, I'll heal myself next year, I'll fix it next year, I'll clear out the attic next year, so to speak, then you create an open space in which new energy can flow. Because as you are surrounded by this layer of thought, it is impossible to move into another space of consciousness or another dimension without traveling through the one that you are the one that you're in now. You cannot take a quantum leap in consciousness and suddenly be someplace else. You can take a quantum leap and say, hey, I'm going to take a new attitude from today, but that attitude is going to take a while to layer around you, to become a force around you. And as you are putting in new thought forms, the old ones are still there, and they do not move unless you give them one hell of a metaphysical kick in the rump. It's a fact. Thought forms etch within the psyche, within the consciousness, tracks. They're like, they're like furrows or canals that, that you go down. And if you look at a person that has not done a lot of work upon themselves, they will, be, they will tend to be surrounded by the same thought forms. They will think the same things, and they will think the same thought over and over and over again. And they will have a pattern of, let us say, 35 thought forms and variations of that thought form that they surround themselves with. And you will look at that and you will see where in your life there has been repetition, where there is the same thought form coming back over and over again regardless of your physical circumstances or the dimension that you're in. I'm not just thinking of thought forms of, say, fear or thought forms of, of, of lack of self-confidence or something like that. But there's other thought forms that we have, you know, sort of various fantasies that we live that come around in our mind over and over again. Various fears, you know, let's say the fear of being ripped off. And you'll find that that maybe, say, comes into your mind over and over again in 95 different variations, but it's always there. You are this conglomeration 
of energy that is characterized or shaped according to the belief patterns and feelings that you have. And to change that, you involve yourself in an inner tussle. This tussle of you saying, I am power. And your mind responding, no, we're not. You know, you saying, I feel good today. And the mind saying, hey, we feel lousy. And we feel that somebody's going to steal our car while we're in the movies. That kind of energy pattern is not something that you can turn, push against, and have it melt away. You can't melt, uh, you know, a million thoughts just by having a different thought. What you have to do is basically understand that the tussle will be continuous. And as you gain more and more ground, like an advancing army, you begin to consolidate areas within your psyche, within your thought forms, within your personality, and you win those areas over to a new energy. So you might say, I want to become a free, individual, positive, powerful person. Great. Okay, now step one is to make a move against, let's say, those parts of your mind that honor and dwell in fear. Okay, you might push against that fear with affirmation, saying, I feel in control, I feel powerful, I understand that this fear is not rational, that it is coming forward from old programming, old stories, old films, old things that have gone on, old tracks inside the mind. I feel strong today. And you would go out and you would leave your car in the parking lot and you would not lock it for the first time, say, in 10 years. Feeling that you had the power within you to hold that car safe, that you had the power within you to do the shopping without worrying about the car getting stolen. Okay, as you begin to push into those areas, the mind, the ego, the personality, the whole psyche will push against you because it is not going to let you win the ground. The psyche or the ego has a way of making you sick to control you. It has a way of making you fail to control you. It has a way of making you scared to control you. Because it has a personality of its own. It is a conglomeration of consciousness that is a person. And it's as if there's two of you in there. And each one of you is battling for control. And so bit by bit, as you develop power around you, you develop a foundation on which your army is going to gain control. Without power, you'll have a thought form, you can have a fantastic affirmation, you can walk out of the day feeling great, hey, this is a sunny day, I feel marvelous, and suddenly, bang, something can happen, it'll just knock you right off your horse. So, we're looking at creating an ambiance of power around you. First of all, I'm going to ask you to write down on a piece of paper 10 things in your life that you want. Now, if you don't have ten, then write three or five or as many as you things as you have. There's no reason why we pick ten. It's just an arbitrary figure. But let us write down those things that you want. Then, when you begin to look at or meditate upon those things you want, you may find that when you really truly feel it out, you realize that you don't actually want that. You want something that is associated to or close to that. So you may want to, say, move from the town that you're in and go and live in a city a thousand miles away, and you may say, I want that. But actually, when you look at it, what you're saying is, I want to create a fresh energy within me, a energy of change. And you represent that in the mind as saying, hey, I want to move to Chicago, where in fact, you can probably create the energy change across the street. However, as you look at the things that you want in life, I want you to begin to formulate affirmations of power around you that are actually going to deliver the things that you want. The first affirmation of power is you have to have intention. You have to actually want it. So many times we think we want something and we have absolutely little or no intention of going and getting it. How much or how many of those things that you want are real? Do you actually want them? Do you actually need them? Is it important to you? Or is it just a daydream, a fantasy, one of those, oh, wouldn't it be nice to spend six months on a beach in Hawaii, that kind of thought form? 
which is, is that actually what you need? Maybe it isn't. Maybe it is. And so as you begin to look at what it is you want, we're going to look and see how strong the intensity is. Think of this. How many times in your life have you, let's say, for example, been in a situation where you're desperate? You know, like there's some desperate situation has come around you and you absolutely categorically have to have $300 by Tuesday, otherwise all sorts of mayhem is going to happen to you. And somehow, some way, the universe or the God force provided it. Somehow, some way, you were saved or the situation was fixed. Okay, what created that? Was that some kind of sort of metaphysical breakdown service or was it the God force with its sort of little breakdown service coming along and saving you because you needed it? No, it was the intensity of your need. It is the parabola or curve of the thought form is so tight, so concentrated, so desperate because of your need that you literally forced reality to give you what you want. It's as if you forced the universal law that your density was so strong that the congruence, it pulled to it a congruent thought form. You know, hey, I need this by tomorrow and suddenly from out of the clear blue sky, there it was. It was the intensity of your feelings, the density that literally attracted. The same way as in the physical plane, a large planet will attract to it a small moon because of the density of the large planet in relation to the density of the little moon. The density of your intention, the concentration of your intention pulled to you in desperate times that saving energy, that saving situation. Okay, as you identify what it is you want, you understand that those things that you do not really want, those things that border upon fantasy or daydream, you will never have. You will only ever accomplish those things that you genuinely feel you can materialize from within you, that you genuinely have an intensity about. And if your thought form is wishy-washy, or it doesn't have the power mode that we're talking about, it will never come about, or almost never. As you develop intention, you also have to lock into that intention dedication. And dedication is another one of those power mode energy bases that will lay the foundation for you. Most people quit a long way before the end. They quit before they get what they want. If you can understand that you, you look at what it is you want, you hone it down to those things you really want, and then you lock in dedication, that is consistency, you will find that the universal law has to give you that thing that you need or that thing that you want because your ded dedication is an affirmation of power. It is you saying, I will never quit. I want to become an architect and I will never quit until I become it. And in that dedication, you move forward. You move through all of the resistance, all of the difficulty, all of what looks hopeless at the beginning, and riding this dedication energy, you lock in around you the power mode of understanding that you will never, never quit until you get what you want. Dedication is rare. It is very rare that you meet people that are dedicated. Most people are so gummy, so sloppy, that, that they, you know, what they put in is so weak, they get very little out. You can have a person that has very little education, that has very little going for them, no capital, no finance, not much, but they're dedicated, and they make it. And you know those people, and perhaps you're one of them. And perhaps you've watched dedication unfold in your life, and you've watched it materialize the things you want, and you've experienced the pleasure of having those things materialize around you. Okay, after dedication, dedication and persistence is basically the same thing. And within that area, we also have to look at inventiveness or craftiness. And craftiness is not necessarily an energy of like the artful dodger or something. It's craftiness is saying, I am going to learn about the physical dimension that I live in. I am going to understand how it works, and I'm going to work with the way it works. And so if, say, for example, you're selling real estate, craftiness is understanding your craft. 
is understanding that, say, selling real estate is a factor of financing. And so you would understand financing. You would know where to get it. You would know who the savings and loans companies were. You would understand the interest rates. You would understand creative financing. You would understand, you know, home loans and mortgages. And you would understand it. And people, generally speaking, want to materialize their dreams, but they don't hold within them craftiness. And craftiness is understanding and taking time taking the botheration to understand how this dimension works. It's amazing how many people are wandering around the physical plane and haven't got a clue how it works, haven't got a clue, say, how to get money, haven't got a clue how to do the things they want to do, haven't got a clue how, let's say, the mind of man actually works. If you do not understand how people work, what motivates them, how would you get them to do what you want? So in understanding craftiness, you understand that thought form is an affirmation, feeling is an affirmation, but craftiness is also the ability of understanding the physical plane, understanding people, understanding psychology, understanding in your area of expertise how the system works. If you do not have a skill, if you do not have a knowledge, then you have to develop one. Most people are not very good at what it is they do, and so they don't get paid a lot. Most people will not take responsibility for their life or for anything else, and so they don't get paid much. A person, let's say, like the chairman of a huge car company who maybe earns a million, a million and a half, two million a year, gets paid that kind of money because he or she is open and wide and big enough to accept the responsibility of something as big as that. You do not get paid for being little. You get paid for being big, for taking the responsibility of being big. And so as you look at what it is you want, you will look at the dedication, you will look at the craftiness, and you will look at creating an energy of persistence within that. All of these things become affirmations of power. They become affirmations of dedication. Some years ago, I was with a group of guys, and there were about 40 men, and we were on a project, a building project in Southern California. And one day, at a sort of staff meeting, the director of the project said, I bet that you guys cannot dig a hole the size of a house using no mechanical equipment in less than two days. Well, we all took upon ourselves this challenge. And we went out to the building sites, and with just picks and shovels, you have to imagine, a hole the size of a house, it's big. I mean, it's like 60, 70 feet one way, it's 30, 40 feet the other way, and it goes down, you know, like 60 feet, 50, 60 feet, because that's how high the house would be if you had the two stories and a roof and a chimney and so on. So we began to dig this hole, 40 people. There was no pay involved, it was a bet between us and the director of this project, that us 40 guys could dig this hole. Well, as we began to dig, we, we, you know, we were digging steadily. You know, we started about 6 o'clock in the evening. And sort of later that evening, it was, a, it was sort of, I think, in the summer, or close to the summer anyway, it was sort of stayed light to about 8 or 9 at night. And we realized that even after 4 or 5 hours of digging, that we hadn't made a lot of progress. So we obviously realized that in order for this project, for us to win the bet, we would have to dig all night. So we found some, some, some lights, and we rigged up these lights, and we began to dig. And as, as we began to dig through the night, okay, it began to rain. And as it rained, the, the, the dirt in the hole became more and more muddy. And as it became more and more muddy, it became harder and harder to dig, and it became harder and harder to take the earth from the hole out of the hole. Because as the hole got deeper, the climb that we had to get the hole out got steeper and steeper. And so, bit by bit, around about, let's say, 4 o'clock in the morning, we really felt that we, we had been defeated. You know, like there was no way that we were ever going to be able to dig this hole in, in, two, in two days. And then suddenly, some guy came up with this simple little idea of rigging up a system of, like, ropes. And so there would be one person would act as a mule, and he would be roped to the wheelbarrow, and he would haul the wheelbarrow, and somebody else would push and with this sort of mule system, where you had a mule in the front hauling the wheelbarrow, we found that we could get the earth up out of the hole, even though it was raining. Well, by about 9 or 10 o'clock the following morning, it stopped raining. And we pushed past, 
We pushed with dedication, with persistence, and with the craftiness of this guy inventing this system with the rope and, the, and hauling the barrows up, and we began to dig at a steady pace, putting one consistent en amount of energy on top of the other, layering energy, let's say, laying one amount on top of the other, and nobody slept. And from time to time, you would take a break, but you would go to the side of the hole there in the building site, and you'd lie down in the sun for an hour or two and rest, but bit by bit, everybody became energized by the project. And, and, of course, what happened was that as the energy of these guys digging in this hole, digging with this mule system, inventing the craftiness, bit by bit, we began to get stronger and stronger. And through the second night, there was this power of these people digging all of the time. There was earth moving all of the time. And there was this symphonic arrangement where you had all of these guys in the hole and nobody hit each other or there was nobody like got a pick in the head. And bit by bit, as we came into the second day, we realized that we were a little bit behind the schedule, like we were going to lose. And so these men that hadn't like, they hadn't slept for a day and a half and they'd been literally doing this incredible physical digging, they began to move faster. They began to lay power affirmation upon power affirmation. And so the affirmation up to that point was, hey, we've dug this much, we've invented these systems, and here we are, but hey, we need more power. So they began to pull from within themselves even more strength, and they began to run. And it was almost like it would bring tears to your eyes because it was so amazing to watch these guys so exhausted but running. And the last eight hours of this whole digging bet or this whole digging enterprise was done on the run. And in the last sort of 45 minutes, when the project was coming nearing completion, the speed that these men moved at was like literally almost at a sprint. And the hole was finished to dimension and size exactly perfectly with about 15 to 20 minutes to spare. So it took the whole of the first day and 23 and three quarter hours of the second day to make this thing happen. But they completed the bet. They completed the whole. And as you look at developing power mode around you, you will find that as you layer thought form upon thought form, you will create around you energy. Then you may find that you have to pull from within you to create even more energy. But as you become energized, moving towards those things that you want, you will find that in moving towards them, using the craft that you have, understanding persistence and dedication, you will be able to materialize those things that you want. And coming into that understanding as you go, you will begin to, to feel a freedom. You will begin to be able to say, I can do it. I can materialize those things I want. And basically speaking, you will experience your word as law. Now, we've discussed that topic in my book, The Force, a little bit. But let me just discuss it here as it applies to affirmation. When you were a small child, you would come up with ideas. You know, you would say, hey, I'm the big chief of the Uli Guli tribe. And your dad would say to you, ah, shut up and get in the car. And so bit by bit, you would create your, you know, you would create an idea and it would be knocked down. You would go out into life as a teenager and you would create, let's say, an aspiration. Hey, I would like to do this. And suddenly you would be knocked down by society because you didn't have the qualifications or you didn't have the world wherewithal. And bit by bit, we lose the power within us that says my word is law. In other words, if you say, I will dig this hole in two days, if you have created power mode around you, you'll dig it. If you say, I will write a hit record within 18 months, that is your word as law. And so bit by bit, as you develop power around you, you'll be able to say something and know that you have the wherewithal to deliver. Then when that thing gets delivered, you anchor it or lock it into your thought pattern or to the storage of the beliefs around you. And you say, hey, last year I said I could dig a hole in two days and I dug it. You know, this year I'm going to materialize a new car and I know I can do it. And then when the new car comes, you build one affirmation upon the next, developing around you this energy of strength, of success, so that when you move out, 
You move out in a cautious, measured way, but you also know that you're going to win. You know that there may be ups and downs, and maybe at half time you might be 15, 20 points down, but by the time the game's over, you'll win. And understanding this concept of you working with your consciousness, you'll be able to see more and more that within you, you create an idea, you voice that idea to yourself, hey, I will materialize this creativity. I will do this thing in my life. And then bit by bit, you will see it realized. And each time you take a thought form from within you, and you see it realized in the physical plane around you, that in itself begins to develop power mode. Power mode can be just small successes. It doesn't have to be some incredible thing. It can be just little things. You know, arriving to work on time, you know, I don't know, mowing the lawn, small triumphs. But as you begin to work with your word as law, you begin to celebrate your personal triumphs. And as you begin to celebrate those triumphs, you create around you the foundation. And that is the second step, so to speak. The second step. The first being understanding that infinity that we talked about in the first side of this tape. The second step is this power mode foundation. Then you can begin to use affirmations and they will work. If you don't have power mode, you could say, I feel great. And the mind will go, no, we don't. So, as you develop that, we'll now go on to the next tape. We'll talk about affirmations of word, of thought, of feeling, of essence. And those affirmations laying upon this power mode foundation that you have around you will work and you will materialize those things that you want. At this point, please go to the second tape. Thank you. In this tape, we're going to look at affirmations of thought and feeling. Basically speaking, an affirmation of word is a verbalized thought form, is it not? And as we use these affirmations, what we're looking at is creating a feeling of control. As I said, are you free? If you do not control each and every aspect of your life, then you're not free. And if you have abdicated control, then did you abdicate control in a controlled way or was the control taken from you? If the control was taken from you, you're not free. However, if you abdicated the control because you delegated the responsibility to another person, say, then that's fine. But do you control your life? As we look at control, we look at control of physical body, control of emotions, control of environment, control of interpersonal relationships, finances, creativity, and a general sense of or feeling of well-being or controlling your life. However, before we can get deeply into the feelings part of all of this, let us look at affirmations of word and let us also look at creating energy. I believe that the strongest part of the day is the early morning, the dawn, for that is the time when, first of all, everybody else is usually asleep. And secondarily, your mind is fresh. Your body is at its most rested. And so, usually speaking, your emotions are calm. Nothing has come into your day to interact. And I feel that that is a time to develop affirmations. And so, within a meditation, or within walking in nature, or within a time of sanctuary that you create within yourself, you would use affirmations to develop an energy pattern for the day. For example, you would wake up and it, I feel that the strongest way to begin the day is to identify with that infinity within. And so I would begin with an affirmation that would say something like this, I'm eternal, immortal, universal and infinite. My expectations are limitless. And there you are saying, hey, I'm in a physical body, I am a mind, I'm a personality, I'm a person, but I know that inside of me there's an infinity and I'm aligning and identifying to that, to that energy. 
Going on from that, I would use an affirmation that would, would incorporate the day that I'm about to enter into. And so an affirmation that I, put, that I use a lot, that I like, goes like this. This is my day. I control each and everything that comes to me. I accept complete responsibility for my life, for I know that I am power. So be it. And here with this affirmation, we're layering another thought form on top of the first one, a thought form of saying, yeah, you know, I control this day, I have power, and whatever comes into this day is going to be a reflection of the inner me, and I know the inner me is stronger and getting stronger, and I control it. And then I would go on with an affirmation like this. May the beauty of this day unfold deeply from within me. May there be energy and strength at all times. And here in this particular affirmation, what I'm looking at is establishing a power and saying, hey, I need this power to take me right through the day. Because to feel good for the first hour and then to feel lousy for the rest of the day won't work. We're looking at trying to create a strong energy and maintaining a balance all the way through the day so that there are no energy peaks or valleys and that we're basically keeping an equal energy throughout the day and understanding that the world, the environment, tiredness, the acidity of the physical dimension will have a tendency to try to pull your energy back all the time. And you're going to resist that. You're going to do things, exercises that I will teach you, things that you're actually going to do, affirmations to hold that power all day. Because if you have an affirmation or you create an affirmation in the early morning and then you come out of your house and you fight with your neighbor about the parking lot or who's going to clear the snow in front of the yard, then everything that you've layered in the early morning is lost. And then if you got involved in a confrontation like that, you would have to take time to pull back within yourself to reestablish that power because the power will constantly want to slip away. Going on with these affirmations, you know, you, you're basically trying to, to maintain a strength in all areas. And so I would go with, a, with an affirmation also that dealt with my physicalness. And I would say something like, the, may the freshness of this day vitalize and heal my body. May there be balance and power at all times. Layering again the same thought form upon the other. Understanding that dealing with affirmations of words, you're going to be dealing with your words, not necessarily my words. Because each one of us has words which mean powerful things to us that do not mean powerful things to another person. When I was a small boy, I went to a very, very old, old English school, a boarding school, and I went there when I was 10 years old. And it was a religious school, and it was very, very strict, and, and there was a lot of religion. And as a part of doing the religion, we had to do a lot of praying. Well, you can imagine the attention of a small 10-year-old boy tends to wane within about 30 seconds, and to sit through a ceremony each morning that takes an entire hour was very, very hard. And so we would make up words for the prayers. We would make up our own prayers. We would change the prayers to amuse ourselves because we had to kind of somehow survive, you know, the ceremonies that we had to go through each day in the early dawn. And so, for example, in the Lord's Prayer, we would take some of the main words of the Lord's Prayer and we would substitute the names of suburbs of London towns and suburbs that are in and around uh, the city of London. Well, you have to really understand London and its suburbs to get the joke, but the, the Lord's Prayer went something like this. Our Farnham, who art in Hendon, harrow be thy name. Thy Kingston come, thy Wimbledon, in Esher as it is in Henley. Well, I won't go right through the whole of the prayer, but that was basically how we kept ourselves am amused as little boys in this church. And the words, Ar Farnham, who art in Hendon, are power words to me because my subconscious mind has heard them and said them a thousand times. Now, you would say, well, that's ridiculous, Stuart, but it's not. In a moment where I would need energy, Ar Farnham, who art in Hendon, harrow be thy name, is strong for me, but of course it won't be strong for you. So as I give you affirmations of words that you might want to work with, you can use mine or you can develop the power words that mean something in your language, in your mindset. This day I express love to each person that I meet.
for I know that I am truly lovable. And when you think about it, if you do not feel lovable, you do not pull people to you that love you. You have to feel lovable. If you're in a cloud or in a haze or you're angry with yourself or you're frustrated, then the people around you will reflect that and they'll be angry and frustrated or they will feel the same kind of restriction. So by creating an energy of feeling lovable, you pull to you love. You pull to you people that are interested in basically supporting you, endorsing you, empowering you, that will be open to your ideas. Moving through the day, of course, most people will be going to work or developing some kind of creativity. And so from those feelings of infinity, of love, of understandings, I would then work with some kind of affirmation about your financial affairs or the totality of abundance that you have around you. An affirmation that I use goes like this. The universe is abundant. Therefore, I feel abundant. My expectations are limitless. And as you work with that, you understand that there is no limit to abundance. In the old philosophy of the mercantile system that was put together many hundreds of years ago in Europe, it was believed that there was a limit to the total wealth. And so during the war with Napoleon, England sold boots to Napoleon's army thinking that by selling him boots, they would be taking his money and they would be weakening him. What happened, in effect, was that his army marched with the boots into more and more countries. And as they conquered the new countries, they got more and more money, and so they could buy more and more boots. And so the system didn't work. Basically speaking, there is no limit to wealth. You're becoming rich, your feeling abundant, your being abundant does not take wealth from other people. It does not take wealth, in fact it creates it. Because if you become abundant, then usually what will happen is that you will spend your money, you will distribute your abundance, you will invite people to partake of, of your abundance, and so your becoming wealthy helps others to become wealthy. And again, in the same way as we looked at power, we're also going to look at abundance because you cannot become abundant if you do not concentrate on abundance. You can't become wealthy if you think that money is evil or that it is not holy to be wealthy. You know, you have to understand that the universal law, the God force, is naturally abundant and that is the natural state for man. All this stuff about poverty being neat or poverty being holy, it was just way that man used to manipulate other men because that is not how the God force manifests. The God force is perfectly delighted with how abundant you become, providing, of course, that you do not inflict restriction upon other people. And it's not as if the God force even says to you, hey, don't restrict these other people because there's plenty of it going around, is there not? All that we say is that if you restrict others, then in turn you create around you a dimension of restriction, and sooner or later something will come forward to restrict you. So as you work with this meditation in the morning, or you work with these affirmations, you understand that you have this intimate relationship with the environment around you that you are the environment and as you become more and more sensitive to that environment you can first of all begin to feel thought forms or events coming towards you but also you can use that sensitivity to place yourself in the right place at the right time because many things whether it is finding the love of your life or or making money in a deal or being accepted as a great violinist or whatever, most of those things are being in the right place in the right time. And so you're going to develop a sensitivity and a, a relationship between your inner feelings and that world that you're moving through. An affirmation that deals with this would be each and every day I am becoming more and more sensitive to my surroundings. I am always in the right place at the right time. And that kind of affirmation sets up that understanding that the inner you and the outer you are one and the same thing. And so as you understand that, you'll find that you have control, that you're beginning through power mode, power play, power thought to develop control around you. And as you develop control, 
you're not being chased by, by two tigers, say, then from within you, in the silence and in the quiet, will come creative ideas. Ideas of how to express yourself. Ideas of how to add to the totality of the beauty and the love in the world. Ideas for making money. Ideas for making your home work in a better way. Ideas for lightening and changing the environment. And dealing with that, or dealing with an affirmation of that, you may like something like this. May the beauty of this day unfold strongly. May the creativity within me manifest to its highest possibility. And understanding that, basically speaking, all creative endeavors, whether it's building a bridge or driving a racing car or painting a painting, start off in consciousness. A bridge is the result of 237 people's consciousness. The designers, the builders, the, the people that locked it together, the people that, you know, it is basically consciousness. And so you will understand that if you do not have creativity within your life, then all we're looking at is enhancing the flow or the stream of consciousness coming from within. As you work with this setting up the energy of the day, I like to walk in nature because nature expresses the life force in purity, beyond emotion, beyond judgment, beyond intellect. And as you lock into nature, you lock into the vitality around you. You lock into the sun shining upon you warming your body you lock into the beauty of the birds the nature around you the trees the vegetation and by being alone for a quiet moment and it doesn't have to be a performance you don't have to sit on a rock cross cross-legged and you know om yourself for four hours it doesn't have to be that complicated it can be just maybe on your way walking out to the car you would take a detour and you would walk around the flower beds and you would stand there for three minutes i am power I am eternal, immortal, universal, and infinite, and I control my life. I am establishing absolute control over every aspect of my life. And that locking in nature allows you to feel the purity that's there, to feel that the day is your day. Then, as you move through the day, there will be a thousand various thought forms. You're going places, you're doing things, there's actions, the phone rings, and so on. And, of course, your energy will change to adapt to these various pieces of information that are coming into your life or the various circumstance changes that you're going through. But as you go through the day, you will understand that there's an absolute need for you to guard the inner energy, to guard the power around you. And so you would take moments out during the day, maybe during the lunch hour. You would just walk out of your office and you would walk through the parking lot and you would stand next to a tree and you would link or anchor the feeling of the morning. And you would say, now what did I feel at dawn this morning? I felt free. I felt fresh. Okay, the circumstances of the last three hours have been anything but fresh. But here I am. I'm linking back to the power. I'm rebuilding. I feel strong. This day proceeds well. I feel successful within it. Notice that we're constantly dealing with creating an atmosphere or a feeling around you. And as you understand that any time you need to pull, you need more energy, that you have this ability to pull in, it can be just a few seconds at a traffic sign, you know, at a traffic light. Pulling in, feeling strong. I feel successful today. There's no limit to my stamina. I receive energy constantly from within me. And if you can establish that link within you, then the ideas begin to flow. And of course you know that. You know that when you're ragged, when you're tired, life becomes hard. You can't get any fresh ideas. You just don't know where the next, you know, the next idea is coming from. But when you're rested, suddenly you get an idea to make a phone call. Hey, I'll call that guy. I haven't seen him for years. Or, yeah, that's an idea. We'll paint it green and blue and package it in little plastic bags and sell it for $1.99. You get ideas about how to make things work. And so in working with affirmations, I would ask you to create power affirmations that mean something for yourself. At the end of the day, I like affirmations before you go to sleep. Again, I like simplicity. I like things that can be done simply and quickly. Just as you lie down and you close your eyes, you might want to give thanks for the beauty of the day. 
I would look at any disasters or any places of negativity, and I would see that there was a learning in that. I would say, now, what did I learn from that situation, from that confrontation, from that difficulty, and from the successes, no matter how small, no matter how little they were, I would link myself to the success. And I would take a moment to review that. One of the techniques that I've talked about on my other tapes, which I just want to review here for those of you that are new, is that at night, I would like you to consider going back through the day backwards in your mind's eye. So you'll be lying down in bed in a relaxed fashion, and you would see yourself, you know, putting on your pajamas, having dinner, arriving home from work, going through the working day or whatever it is you did, going right the way through, reviewing all the circumstances of the day, right going back to dawn. And in so doing, you release energy from the psyche. It's a way of clearing out consciousness and allowing the mind to collate and establish what it felt about the day. I believe it reduces the amount of time that you have to do a certain type of dreaming that basically is, is, is sort of collating, processing, and getting rid of the garbage type of dreaming. And I believe that during the night, we communicate with our higher self. And if we do not have to be in the garbage, collating, processing type of dreaming, it allows us a deeper entry to the true spirituality within us. I believe at night that if we, we have the ability to travel back into those dimensions and really look at the real us, to look at our true motivations, to look at our true goals, and to look at what it is we want to become at night. Using this night process, you can often ask a question of the inner you, the higher self, or the God force, or the guiding light that is there within you, or the guides that are a part of your life. And the way you would do that is, you would review the day backwards, as I've just said, and then you would put up the thought form or the question that you have. You know, hey, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? What is the strongest path? Shall I marry Harry or shall I marry Tony? You know, whatever the question might be. And then you would come forward with some kind of affirmation that might say something like, May the power that guides me show me the way, and may I see the answer to the question that I pose. Then put the question up in your mind and understand that within the infinity of all things, we can never understand how the process works. But usually, you will find that the answer of the question is in your mind in the morning. And if it is not, it usually presents itself during the day. It shows you. Often, it shows you by not showing you. It shows you by there being no answer. And so when you look at the no answer, you can say, well, what kind of no answer did I receive? And the kind of answer you received was, do nothing. Because if there's no answer, then the answer to your question is nothing. And the answer to nothing is do nothing. And often the answer to your question will be, hey, in this situation, wait, do nothing, pull back, wait, and it'll unfold. Okay, as we go into this night mode, we understand that the night time is not just this place where we refresh the body. Something can be going on in consciousness, and you can set it up so you can allow the night to be there for you, to allow the darkness of the night to allow you to, to create within you progress so that you are touching deep within you and you are collating and understanding and processing your, light, your night. An affirmation I sometimes use is, may the dark of this night allow the light within me to shine ever greater. For I'm eternal, immortal, universal, and infinite. And another one that I like is uh, an affirmation that throws out the thought form. You know, may I go out into this night and be a part of all things. May I serve in whatever way I might serve. May I learn in whatever way I might learn. May this night be for refreshment, for healing. And finally, as your eyes close and you're, you're dropping off to sleep, you would consider something like, may the rest that I experience this night allow me to awake refreshed, positive, loving, and ready for a new day, and so be it. And so, as you work with words, you begin to understand that you're pumping power, you're pumping energy. Thought forms have various degrees of power. You know, certain thought forms have no power at all, and other thought forms are extremely powerful. As we look at that, you're, we're going to discuss five ways of developing thought power, 
of developing intensity so that your thought forms move from consciousness into reality, into physical reality, where you can experience them. In thought form empowerment, we will look first at life force. You are basically a quantum or a totality or a, a bunch of, say, life force. The thought forms you create are empowered by you thinking them, but they have within them also intrinsic life force. The amount of power that you experience, the amount of life force that you have. And you know what it's like. You've met people that have incredible vitality and others that are like as dead as a wet flannel. Well, those thought forms that are created by the person who is like an old flannel are weaker than the thought forms that come from a person that experiences or expresses vitality. And so understanding that your power or your ability to use word affirmations or thought affirmations comes from also your vitality. And your vitality is intimately linked to A, your control of emotion, B, your control of your body, and also partly your control of positivity. And so if your body is sluggish or you feel there's not enough energy there, then the strength of the thought form will not be as, as strong. So in thought form power, we're looking at number one, life force, the quantity of life force, literally the physical and metaphysical metabolism that you express. Are you vital? Are you bright? Are you ready? Are you up for the project? Are you up for the day? When you say, I control this day, do you? Or is it just mumblings? Is it just words? Okay. Second thing in thought form empowerment, variance. Now let me describe to you, let me explain to you what variance is. We live in the contents of our belief patterns, and much of what we believe or that we think about is fantasy. It is not actually real. We fantasize maybe being in the Super Bowl and, and you know, creating the winning, uh, the winning uh, touchdown, uh, the winning score, or we fantasize a great love affair, or we fantasize being on a beach, but we do not actually live it or believe it. We know that that is not something that is going to happen to us. It is a way the mind has of playing, of, 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 of just messing about. Okay, the difference or the, the gap between the fantasy part of you and the real part of you is the variance. And if the variance in your life is very, very great, what happens is that most of your power or most of your consciousness or most of your thought power is dissipated in fantasy and very little of it is centered in the now, in the reality. And so you live, basically speaking, an unreal thought form position or thought form layer. So there are around you, basically, a degree of non-reality. As you understand this, the complexity of this concept of variance, what you would do to strengthen your thought form power would be reducing the fantasy and coming back within yourself to being real. Hey, what is actually real in my life? Okay, this does not mean that one cannot dream about some place that we're moving to or a love affair that we might be in or a beach or whatever. We can have our daydreams, but we cannot live in the daydreams. Because if in consciousness you live the daydreams, then the variance is so great that when you try to materialize the, the daydream, it has already been created on an inner level and you've spent the energy. And so the variance is saying, hey, it's okay to fantasize, it's okay to dream, but let us bring it back tight, okay? The real reality, hey, where am I today? What is the dimension that I am in? What is actually the stock that I have? Where have I got to so far? A lot of people want to be in a sort of stardom consciousness. They, they, you know, they want to be discovered. And perhaps you've had that thought. I certainly remember that when I, was, when I was younger, hoping that somebody would, like, come along and scoop me up, so to speak. Well, nobody will ever discover you if they have no reason to discover you, if you haven't done anything, if you haven't got anything going for yourself, if there's no vitality there. And so if you live in that sort of stardom consciousness, you're living in a variance and it will never happen. 
The way to become a star, if that's what you're interested in, is to begin to develop a skill, let's say you're a singer, and you begin to move towards stardom by creating records, writing songs, doing the things that you do, playing the violin, whatever. Okay, and then the, suddenly the variance is reduced and you live in reality. And then somebody can discover you because you're actually out there doing it. You're singing someplace and somebody can watch you singing and can say, hey, I like the way this guy sings. I like the way she plays the violin. And you can be picked up and scooped up and an opportunity can come. But a lot of people, in, as, as a way of sort of compensating for their inability to materialize in their life, they live in fantasy. And the variance of who they are in relation to what they're actually thinking about or what they believe they are is so different, so wide, that in fact they are unable to materialize things in their life. The third part of the thought form power that I want you to consider was the thing that we talked about in the first tape, which was identity. If you do not believe that you are the God force within, if you do not believe that the light is within you, then you have a lack of metaphysical identity. And usually that will materialize in a lack of psychological identity. You won't know who you are, and you won't feel strong about yourself. Okay? So identity is basically knowing that that infinity is within you, and that infinity grants you the right to be here. It grants you the reason for being on the physical plane and it grants you to be a special individual okay all right as you look at that it's not so important in the early part of your life because in the early part of your life you're basically collating looking at experimenting deciding who you are but in later life especially once you cross let's say the age of 30 to 33 and you begin to really consolidate who you are and where you're going in life it is especially important for you to have a strong identity of the infinity within you. That is important. Okay, so identity is particularly important. I'm going to talk to you now about congruence, space-time, and concentration, but I'm going to have to turn over to the next side of this tape to handle that. So if you'd be so good now, I would ask you to turn the tape at this time. Okay, as we look at affirmations of words and we look at affirmations of thought, we understand that there is a power to the thought forms we have. Weak thoughts, strong thoughts, thoughts that materialize in the physical plane, and thoughts that just dissipate out, almost like mist, and it just disappears and is gone in the cold light of day. Okay, we looked at identity. The fourth part of, or the next aspect of this thought form empowerment, I, we have to look at congruence. And congruence is basically rides hand in hand with identity and is actual fact maybe a, a, a sub-subject to identity or, or sort of the B-side to identity. It's not saying, look, I am the God force within and then the congruence is you living and breathing it. Feeling beautiful no matter what you have in your life, no matter how pretty you are. Feeling positive, feeling that there is an eternity, feeling that there is a meaning to life and living it, becoming congruent with the identity within you, saying, hey, I'm eternal, immortal, universal, and infinite. I'm not this physical body. I'm not the problems. I'm not the financial. I'm not my children. I'm not the, the tribe I live in. I'm not the religion. I'm an identity beyond all of that. And so identity and congruence ride hand in hand because first you identify with it, and then you become it. It is almost like you express it from every part of you. You may be a total weirdo, but at least you're individual, you know? And people might say, well, you know, she's a bit strange, but she's individual. And she does these very individual things, and she is an individual. We have to say that for her. So congruence is literally living and breathing the identity that you've established, okay? Moving on from congruence, I want to talk to you for a moment on space-time. You live in a continuum of space-time. There is a place where you are and a place where you are not, and you are within time. The mind created time as a way of measuring. Basically speaking, the inner you exists in the eternal now. 
Now, you can have a thought form that is in time or in future time, but the inner you is not in future time. And so, if a lot of your thought forms are in the future, what you're basically saying is, it will never happen. I am placing this thought form out ahead of me because I do not believe it will ever happen. In order to create change, you have to have it in the now, and you have to feel the change in the now. Because there is no future self, basically speaking. It is the now. And you can say, well, okay, Stuart, there's a point where next Friday is going to be next Friday. Yes, but you cannot create a thought form that will create next Friday. All you can say is, okay, next Friday, I am going to go and have lunch with my boyfriend, let's say. Okay, so you're going to go meet this person that you love next Friday, and you can visualize that, and you can see yourselves arriving at the restaurant with your loved one, and you can see yourself sitting there. However, on Friday, he turned up late. You didn't go to the restaurant. It was raining. The restaurant was full, and you went to the movies. You see, as you look at creating future thoughts, what you're actually doing when you're thinking about the future is fantasizing or guessing what it might be. In fact, the future comes from within you, but it comes from the eternal now each day. And so you're moving from one eternal now into the next eternal now. If your consciousness is very future-oriented, you're basically dealing with variance again. You're dealing with living in a consciousness that is not real, that is not what is actually happening. What is actually happening is where you are right now sitting here or standing here or driving in your car or whatever you're doing, the eternal now. And so to deal with the space-time continuum thing is, is to understand that the inner you is creating the future. The inner you can say, hey, yeah, you know, next year I'm going to be an architect. But if you spend too much time fantasizing it, y it doesn't happen. What happens is to empower the thought, you have to live and breathe architect right now, even if you're not an architect yet. You have to live and breathe abundance, even if you're not abundance. You have to feel healthy, even if your body's sick. You have to feel beautiful, even if what you have around you isn't that beautiful. And so we're looking at creating it in the now, so that it can materialize in the future. Because the future is actually the future present, not the future future. There is a gradual state of becoming, and each state of becoming builds on what went before. True. But your consciousness has to be centered in reality in the now moment. And many people have a tendency to drift into the past or into the future. The future is fantasy. The past is reminiscing. And even though you can think about the past and say, Oh, wasn't it the golden, the golden years, the golden age? All of that does not change now. In fact, the very thought form of, Oh, yes, I can think back to those golden days, is you saying today is not golden. Today is not one of those golden days. Today is lousy compared to, hey, how wonderful it was, you know, 20 years ago. And so we're looking at, with affirmations, of creating a personality or creating a consciousness within you that is living in the now. Finally, the last part of thought form empowerment is basically speaking concentration. And I don't mean it necessarily in the sense where a person would say to you, concentrate on the subject. Concentration is basically the density of the thought form. There are two parts to concentration. There is consistency and there is density. Perhaps I should talk about consistency first. Consistency is basically you layering one thought on top of another. I feel good today. Layered on top of a thought form that says, I'm eternal, immortal, universal and infinite, I control my life. Consistency is coming up with something that you want and holding that intention and layering it once over the next and over the next. Not irritating the thought form, not pining, not having negative yearning about what it is you want because that will actually push it away from you, but gradually moving in a measured way, in a measured step, layering one thought form upon another. I want to achieve this particular goal in my life. I feel good about the goal. I'm moving towards it. Today I'm layering some consciousness in that area. I'm taking some action. I'm moving in a measured way, layering one thought form upon another. And that allows a concentration of thought forms around you that hold that intention. Consistency. A lot of people will head off towards a goal and they'll become distracted. And perhaps you have in your life, where you've headed off towards something and you sort of halfway through forgot what it is you were going for. 
Consistency is saying, this is my goal and I'm moving towards it. And you're layering the thought forms or feelings within you into the eternal now and saying, this is what I have. This is what I'm going to get. The second part of concentration, dealing with thought power, is basically density or intent. As we said before in the previous ta tape, there have been times in your life where desperation has saved you. Okay, if you understand that certain thought forms are very sort of wispy like, if you saw them, you would see them like mist because they're fantasy, they're gossamer, they are these sort of daydreams. And then there are other thoughts that have high intention. The high intention thoughts have greater strength and greater density than the wispy ones. And the density or concentration of your thought form helps you to pull that thing to you. You see, you put around you this, let's say, this very in strong intention, okay? And you walk out into the physical plane, and around you is all consciousness. There are other people that have various forms of consciousness. And usually, to materialize what you want in life, there's going to be another person involved. They're going to give you the money or give you the thing or they're going to be the soulmate that you're looking for, whatever it is. There is consciousness out there. You, living in a sea of consciousness, if you have tight and powerful thought forms, it pulls to you stronger. And so concentration deals with consistency and it also deals with intent or density of the thought form. And that is important for it allows you to pull quickly and easily from the energy that is around you. Okay, as you develop word affirmations, you develop thought affirmations, saying I feel good, thinking you feel good, we next go on to establishing a feeling or an affirmation of feeling around you. Words are strong, thought forms are stronger, feelings are even stronger still, because feelings are what create the dimension around you. And when you think back to a time in your life that was pleasant, you will remember the feeling. You'll remember, let's say, a home that you lived in 20 years ago, and you won't necessarily remember whether the, the walls were painted pink or blue, but you'll remember how it felt. If you think of a person that you haven't seen for a long time, you will not necessarily be able to remember their face in minute detail, but you'll be able to remember a feeling of an aspect of their personality, the way they laugh, the way they move their eyes, some kind of little mov movement or gesture, the way they walked. There will be a feeling that you'll remember. Basically speaking, you live in a dimension of feeling. Dealing with power affirmations of feeling, what you're basically going to look at is coming back to the same theme over and over again of establishing control and through control establishing freedom. This involves discipline, it involves dedication, and it involves you looking at those parts of your life that you do not control and asking yourself, why don't I control it? And then, if you don't control it, let us move towards controlling it. In feeling affirmations, or in dealing with feeling affirmations, we're going to look at affirmations of feeling in control of your body. Okay? You have to feel secure there, because if you feel you're dying, or if you feel some incredibly exotic disease is developing in your toe or something, then how can you feel an affirmation of power? You can't. So, number one is control of the physical body, because if that stops, your, your progress through the physical plane stops with you, okay? Secondarily, you're going to look, as you move through the day, of a feeling of control of emotions, okay? Now, this does not mean you cannot have emotions, but it means that you're going to try to establish a control over your emotions, that things are not going to seem so horrendously large or so horrendously difficult. You know, if the house burns down, eh, we'll move to another. You know, if the car won't start, I'll take a taxi or I'll walk. If so-and-so doesn't show up, that's fine. I'll sit here in the park and wait for them until they do show up. And if they don't, that's fine also. Developing a feeling about a life around you that whatever happens is fine, that you feel in control. You know, and if you walk down through the day and you have a plan and suddenly the plan changes dramatically, that wherever it is you're going will be okay. I'll be fine when I get there. I will feel the power within me, and I will understand the vibrancy, and the vibrancy will be beautiful. Understanding that you have to come into control of emotions. The next thing we're going to look at is establishing a feeling of control over your thinking process, so that the thinking does not drive you buggy, so it does not pull you into frustration, into fear, into fantasy, into all of these areas that can, de can develop into difficulties, that you establish a control over your thinking, so that basically you stop thinking. 
that you allow the thinking process to, to sort of show you how to get to the bus station, but you don't think yourself into a corner. You don't think yourself in t in to where you can hardly move. And there are certain types and personalities in the world, and especially among men, where literally thinking becomes a religion. You know, like there's such a logical process that it does not allow for the unexpected. It does not allow for the illogical. It does not allow for the spontaneity of the life force. And so the next thing after emotion is establishing a feeling of control over your thought forms. And control also means in a meditation, can you sit and meditate and not think? Well, do a thousand thoughts that are irrelevant pour into your mind? If you set out for a goal, do you have a concentration? Do you have a density? Or does your mind drag you all over everywhere? So you're looking at establishing a feeling of control over thinking. The next thing is you're going to want to have a feeling of control over your environment. That means the place you live, the place you work. It has to have beauty. It has to have life force. It has to have freshness. It has to be a place that endorses you, a place that you control, you know, a place where you are in command. When you walk into your home, you can shut the door and there is sanctuary. Your home, home is warm, it is comfortable, it is fresh, it has beauty, it has caring, it has love, it has life force within it. And so I would ask you to look at the environment and say to you, does your environment create within you a feeling of security, a feeling of that freshness, of that healing, of that rejuvenation? If it doesn't, then let us look at moving. Let us look at changing it. Let us look at putting some energy into it so it becomes what it is you want. The same with your workplace. If you work, if you're an average working man or woman, you're going to spend a third of your life working. Well, are you prepared to spend a third of your spiritual quest in an atmosphere that doesn't endorse you? You know, in a situation that's negative or with a bunch of people that you don't like? No, you're going to pull away, pull out, and you're going to create it the way you want. Now, you may not be able to create it immediately in two minutes. It might be, let's say, a six-month process. Hey, I'm going to work for six months in this dumb place, but bit by bit, gradually, I'm going to move to become what it is I want to become. Or I'm going to change this factuary, and I'm going to paint it pink, and we're going to have little flowers hanging from the ceiling because that's what I feel I need while I'm working on this conveyor belt. Or whatever it is. But bit by bit, as you develop freedom, you understand that you have to develop freedom in every area, that you cannot you know, be free for 3 hours and 22 minutes and then go and work in some place where you're totally manipulated, where the atmosphere is lousy, where the whole place is detrimental to your being. There's people that will be prepared to do that and you let them do it. You see, freedom is not for everybody. You know, it's not for everybody. It's only for those people that want to, that have this yearning desire within them to create it to be individuals. There's millions of people out there that have got no intention of being an individual beyond a certain amount. And they will do those things. So if you ask the question that is often asked, well, who will drive the trains, Stuart? Well, there's millions of people that will drive the trains. There's millions of people that will work, you know, in the sweatshops. It's fine. They have a learning. And it doesn't make you or me higher or lower than anybody else. It's just you withdrawing within yourself saying, I want that freedom. The way to create an affirmation of power is to understand that you always have the ability to vote with your feet. That you can always walk out of any situation that you do not control, that you do not like. Okay, we tend to feel that we're trapped by thought form, by fear, by false sense of security. Hey, I've got to do this job because I need to eat. And that is not the case. There's a way of de-escalating one dimension and recreating another that suits you. And so you look at your environment. Does it feel strong? Does it support you? You would look then, the next thing in the feeling affirmation is, let us look at the interpersonal relationships. Do the people around you support you? Do they endorse you? And if they don't, I would say to you lovingly, get rid of them. Because you are not obliged in life to drag a whole bunch of dregs with you. If they won't brighten up, cheer up, become positive, get with a plan, I would vote them out of your life. And the way you vote them out of your life is you do not judge them or criticize them or say, hey, you guys are no good. You basically withdraw. You pull away and someday suddenly you're not there anymore. And people say, what have happened to Harry? And they say, oh, I think he moved to Bujumbura. Okay, you pull out because nobody asks you to suffer relationships that don't work. 
And if you're in a marriage that doesn't work, I would say, hey, get with your partner. Say to them, look, I love you, you love me. Now let's look at why this thing isn't working. And if you can't compromise, you get out of it because you come together for growth. You do not come together for life. Okay, if you're growing in a relationship and it suits you and it's helpful, great. If it's an absolute drag, try to fix it, try to work with it in some way or other. And if you can't, vote with your feet. That is your power. The power to move, mobility, is the way that you will establish control of your life. Okay, moving on from interpersonal relationships, you would look at next thing of creating a feeling of abundance around you, of finances being under control, of you having a certain amount of money coming in. You've got to have a love of money. Because if you don't, you're never going to have the wherewithal to do the things that you want to do in life. And there's a whole world to see. You're living at the time of the greatest creativity in, in humankind. And you're going to need money to enjoy it, to experience it. You see, to go through the physical plane, you do not have to become a master of every aspect of it. You just have to have experienced it and taken it into your consciousness. So you do not have to understand Spanish and the whole Spanish history to understand that energy. You can just go to Peru, go to Venezuela, stay there for a week, get a feeling for the place, get a feeling for the people, try to understand as much as you can, and you've locked it into your consciousness and you've experienced it. So you've got that whole world out there, literature, music, art, television, films, travel. You've got to be a part of it, and you're going to need money to be a part of it. There's no other way. Okay. Moving on from, from money, we're looking at creativity. You're going to want to feel a feeling or an affirmation of creativity. Hey, what am I doing? Because basically, creativity is a physical manifestation of the God force. And so you're going to want to have creative ideas and develop them and bring them into the physical plane. And that is your gift for the physical plane. No matter what it is you do, whether you fly an aircraft or you, you're a surfboard instructor, you teach people to go surfing, or whatever it is that you do, you're a writer, or you, or you calculate things, or you drive a bus, there's a creativity that you can bring to your life. And there has to be a feeling of creativity, because that feeling of energy coming from the inner worlds and coming out through creativity empowers you. It helps you to feel in control. The neatest thing, I think, is to develop a creativity and to find a way of selling it to people so that they accept it and they give you money so that you can be supported doing the thing that you love to do. Once you get to that position in your life, then I would say to you, let us do what it is we love to do and let us become as good as we can at it. Let us become crafty in our craft and become good at that. And finally, in affirmations of feeling, we're looking at creating a feeling of controlling the totality of your life. And you would be almost like a sort of a security guard on a big estate. You would be constantly patrolling your life to make sure that each part of it is designed to support you, to endorse you, to make you feel strong. And when it isn't, you will go in, you will try to compromise, you will try to work with it, you will deal with it in some way, and if you can't change it, you withdraw. Affirmations of feeling is basically feeling strong. Taking a moment each day to feel free. Hey, I'm free. And I'm doing whatever I'm doing from choice, not because of fear, not because of security, not because of manipulation, not because of obligation. I'm doing it because I want to do it. Taking 10 seconds to feel free. Taking 10 seconds to feel independent. Hey, I might be a bit of a weirdo. I might be a bit of a wacko, but I feel independent. Okay? Taking 10 seconds to create within you a feeling of self-confidence. And you can never tell somebody, hey, be self-confident. You know, it's like saying to somebody, don't be scared. That's silly. But self-confidence is basically that power mode again, you developing one success after another, living in your triumphs, and taking time to learn from your disasters and releasing the disasters as quickly as possible. Taking the 10 seconds of feeling self-confident. You know, you stop someplace, just feel powerful, feel the energy exuding from your body and say, hey, I feel confident about the way I'm going through this physical life. Taking 10 seconds to feel assured all is well. It'll all be all right on the night. It'll all be okay. This inner power within me, the Lord, the life force, the God force will provide. And I know because I take enough action, because I do enough things, because I have a craft or craftiness, that it'll all be well. Feeling assured. An affirmation, 10 seconds, that feels worthwhile. What I do is important. I feel empowered. I only plant 
pea pods and little rows, and that's what I do for, for my life. But I feel this is worthwhile. I feel a strength. I feel a need to be here. I am here. I am what I am. And what I am has beauty and strength. Ten seconds from time to time to stop and feel worthwhile. Ten seconds to stop and feel creative. Remembering those things that you've done that are creative and feeling them. And ten seconds to feel that you are a part of all things. I am truly eternal. I'm a part of nature. I'm a part of the wind. The wind blows through me, through the freshness of what I am. The sun rises from within me. The vegetation is a part of my life force. I'm a part of all things. I am the spirit of the wind. I'm the spirit of nature. I'm the spirit of the earth plane. I'm the eternity. I exude a non-infringing, non-critical love. I allow my self-independence and I love everybody else because I will allow them also to be free, to be independent. I will not infringe upon them. That is an affirmation of feeling. Having established that, layering it on top of the thought, on top of the word, on top of the power mode, you finally move into what I would describe as the mastership of life. You become a master of the physical plane. You don't know it all. You haven't experienced it all. You still make mistakes. You're not a holy moly on a mount somewhere that people are coming to listen to. But you understand the physical plane. You have within you fluidity. And fluidity is important because you have to be able to feel that you can move. You may not choose to move, but you have to feel that you can, that you can go from one country to the next, from one state to the next, from one culture to the next, that you can take your energy pattern any place and you will feel safe. You can create around you abundance. You can move. I feel fluid in this situation because I control a hemisphere of influence that is very large. I control a hemisphere, a physical environment that has a lot of wherewithal within it. As you deal with that energy within you, you come into what I call an affirmation of essence. And an affirmation of essence is you basically being your affirmation. Not thinking it, not saying it, not developing a 10 second feeling, but your life is an affirmation. There is a linkage or an anchorage. Your power plays, your power modes have become so strong that you can look at your entire life and you can say, this house I live in is an affirmation of what I am. This car I drive is comfortable, it's strong, it's pleasing, I like the sound system, it's an affirmation of me feeling mobile, feeling abundant. My body, it feels strong. It is an affirmation of what I am. My thought forms are in control. I don't accept negative thought forms. And when they come up, I take a moment to bat them down again. I feel fear, I feel insecurity, and I stop and I say, I don't accept that energy pattern. I'm eternal, powerful, positive. I feel good about myself. And bit by bit, the affirmation of essence is you linking your entire life to this crescendo of energy. Is the beingness, it becomes the beingness of all things. Being real. That is living in the now, seeing where you are, seeing it beautiful, and knowing you can move forward. It is being open. Understanding that you have a power that the average man and woman does not have. And so you have to be open. There has to be a feeling of, I'm open. I'm open to receive more information. I'm open to change my belief patterns. I'm open to moving. I'm open to the people. I'm open and I'm ready. Being magnanimous that comes from being open. A feeling that you are not dealing with a limitless supply. So if a guy says, hey, can I borrow your, your, low, your lawnmower? You say, yeah, take it. Have it if you want. I'll get another. A feeling of magnanimousness that there's no limit to how much you can do, how much you can achieve, what you can become in this lifetime. Dealing with an affirmation of essence, next we would go on to being spiritual, understanding that the physical plane with all its trials and tribulations is basically this glorious journey that you're passing through. And you develop within you a path of power that deals with you understanding the world and its spirituality. That you see pain not as pain, but as learning. That you see difficulty not as difficulty, as challenges. And developing a spirituality and understanding that you are going to celebrate your triumphs. 
Moving on from there, we're going to look at you being fair. And being fair is basically an affirmation of essence that says, I will leave the world alone. I'm not going to get in there and judge one group and not judge another or try to cut it up one way and cut it up the other way. Being fair is allowing other people to be what they want to be. That is fairness. That, I believe, is love. Because I think the greatest gift that you can give somebody is to leave them alone. Loving them is letting them go be whatever they want to be. Then from within this essence of power, you're going to develop being strong. And strong is not taking that strength and infringing upon others, but being strong within yourself, within the dawn, within the early morning, feeling that power there. Developing within you a feeling of you moving through life in a measured step, having patience, having power. Hey, I move through this day. I don't have all of the things I need yet. I don't have everything around me, but I'm moving step by step in a cautious, without being negative way. I'm moving through the life that I'm leading, and I understand that this day is a part of the eternal now. I feel vitality. I feel strength. I feel wealth. I have the health and the strength around me. I'm a part of all things. If today is the day that my body stops, that's perfect for me because I feel the universality within me and I know that I will drift automatically to the next dimension, the next endeavor. That I was eternal, immortal, universal and infinite before I began and I have this affirmation that I know that if today is the day that I quit the earth plane that I will be eternal, that I'll never be more alive than the moment when my body stops. And as you begin to develop that, then you can develop within you an essence of self-love because you feel comfortable. And if you feel comfortable, you can love yourself. And when you can develop a power of love within yourself, hey, I am truly lovable, then it becomes simple to love others. Expressing love for the world is simple when you feel comfortable. And so if you've developed over a period of time these things that we've talked about, suddenly self-love and self-image is easy, and then loving the world is simple, and then you become a custodian of light, a manifestation of the life force. And you walk through life, and what you do is you empower the people that you meet. It is almost as if the flowers grow and become brighter and stronger and more colorful because you have walked down the path of life. Dealing with this affirmation of essence, the only, the only pitfall, I think, or one of the main pitfalls is that as you develop power around you, then suddenly the ego begins to think that you're an incredibly important person. And so you become like one of those Mickey Mouse gurus where you begin to pull people around you that are worshipping your power, worshipping your mastership of life. And if you do that, be careful. Because it is so simple to create a power within you and then lose it again. And if you have people coming around you, they should come and they should drink from the well and they should go. Once there's worship, once there's relying, once they start pitching their tents literally around you in the garden, around you, so to speak, metaphysically, then suddenly you become the God force for them rather than, than them seeing the God force within them. And then suddenly all of you have all that garbage that comes about through spirituality. And people come and they see your power and then suddenly you will get you will drift back into manipulation. You'll drift back into being the great guru, the great teacher, and you'll you'll you know, you'll find yourself manipulating the people, you know, controlling them, giving them a thousand do's and don'ts, and they swap one dumb bunch of beliefs for another dumb bunch of beliefs. So as you develop power mode, I would ask you to retain the thought of the silent sages. To be a power person, a mastery of life kind of person, but to do it in such a way that you're not pulling around you a great flock of people that are, that are, you know, that are living and breathing your every word, but that you give to them in whatever way that they, they want, and you only give when they come to you, when they are pulled to you. You don't go out and seek them and say, hey, anybody here needs saving, I'm the great guru. And then when you can live like that, then I believe the spirituality within you really, really develops because you drift away from, from the, common, the, the common struggle and you begin to develop a power within yourself, a light. And I believe that that light, bit by bit, will allow you to perceive other worlds within you, other dimensions, and you will go to other creativities, to other spiritual endeavors while you're still upon the physical plane. It is almost as if, having completed the physical, you will enter into another dimension of self. That, to me, 
is a crescendo of power within you. That is the power mode. And so as you go through life, let us look at those words. I am what I am. And what I am has beauty and strength. So be it. Thank you.